Hey folks, as you can see, all of my upgrades have come in and I am ready to, to build my new machine. Uh, what you see on your left side here are all like existing parts, stuff that was in my old box. Everything on the right are brand new, haven't even unboxed them parts that just came in over the last couple of weeks or so. So what I'm going to do today is treat this almost like a live stream. I'm going to not cut anything together. I'm going to just you know, build the, the machine on camera, uh, babble while I do it, tell you why I picked the parts that I picked. Uh, and just uh, kind of have a chill afternoon putting together my computer. So first, uh, let's talk about everything I got on the table so I can get it off the table. Uh, starting with the case, uh, Leon Lee Landcool 2 Mesh. Uh, I've reviewed this case. There's, <clears throat> there's another video on the channel that talks in depth about the case itself. The case has been used. Uh, I got it on Prime Day like a month and a half, two months ago, something like that. So my old build was in this computer. Uh, so some of the stuff has been done. I've already installed the extra exhaust fan, already installed the front USB port, um, and already installed. There's a uh, hot swap back plate that we'll talk about when we get to the case. Uh, so the case has been used a little bit, but it's still fairly new. I'm going to get it off the desk and get it out of the way for now. Okay, uh, we'll go through the old stuff first. Uh, these are just little uh, containers that I put my screws and stuff in. Um, I separate them by thread, so these are large thread casing, small thread casing, and actual like outside you know screw in thumb screws for the case. I'm going to put these behind me for now. My power supply is a Corsair CX750. 750 watts should be plenty for what I'm putting into it. Um, this is quite old, as you are probably aware if you've been shopping for PC parts now. For some reason, PSUs are extremely expensive. Uh, so I did not even consider upgrading PSUs for this go around. I already have three hard drives in the Leon Lee sleds. Again, this case has been used for, for a little while and putting a hard drive in a sled isn't exactly interesting. So these are already ready to go, just ready to slide into the case itself. Uh, for storage, I have a Sabrent Rocket Q1 terabyte M.2 SSD. That's going to be the primary storage. I have a Bywin 500 gig uh, SSD. This was pulled from uh, kind of like a cheap laptop that had this is its primary SSD, but this SSD would, was unable to go into like certain low power modes, which caused the entire laptop to eat up too much battery. So I replaced it. Uh, I don't really care much about a little bit of M.2 power going into the big box. So he's going to be a secondary SSD. Uh, Western Digital Blue, traditional three and a half SSD, two and a half SSD, two and a half SSD. Um, this guy is mostly used for my Steam library. What we have here is uh, 32 gig, this four eight gig DIMMs of a PC3200. This is Timitech memory. It's a no name brand. Uh, they use Hynix chips. They use decent chips, but as you can see, there's no heat spreader. There's nothing fancy about this RAM, but it seems to work fine. Uh, I ran it at 2933 in my old machine. It should be able to run 3200. People online have had good luck with it, uh, even a little above 3200. Um, may have to manual, manually set some timings, but uh, it is. it was dirt cheap uh, back when memory was kind of expensive. Nowadays, memory's real reasonable. So, you know, get decent name brand memory. Don't follow my lead and, and go with this cheap off name stuff. Uh, same goes for SSDs. SSDs are so cheap, there's no reason not to spend a very little bit more and get something that's better in name brand. Uh, this is my video capture card, Live Gamer HD2. He's just gonna go in there. And I think that does it for the existing stuff. This is just regular old tiny cable ties. And uh, this is Win Windows installation media. So. That should be ready to go. So now some unboxings. Let's see what all we got here. We're gonna start with least interesting to most. So let's start with this Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black Edition. When it comes to cooling, I'm an air cooling fan because I, I, I prefer reliability over a little extra performance. And AIOs, while you know, there are horror stories and they're, and they're you know, few and far between. I'd rather just not have to deal with it. Like I don't want to have to deal with gunked up 
pumps. I don't want to have to deal with potential water leaks. Um, I feel like you have to get something. If you're going to get an AIO, you should get something pretty nice. Get like a Corsair or something like that. Uh, whereas this cheap little, I want to say it was $25 air cooler, uh, does just fine. And air cooling and AIOs compete neck and neck. AIOs have a longer saturation time. Uh, so if you're boosting and, and unboosting a lot, then yeah, an AIO might, might see some tangible performance benefits. Uh, but if you're running, you know, long, hard tasks, then you're not going to get much out of an AIO over air cooling. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of in the air cooling camp. Uh, now I do need a knife or something to open these guys. So let's go grab that. <clears throat> I do have a second camera here, so if you hear that beeping, that's the uh, GoPro starting and stopping. All right. All right, so here is the Hyper 212 Black Edition. Uh, it's a chonky cooler, but it's not bad. It's, it's not too awful terrible compared to like a Wraith or something built in. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big boy, but it's nothing, you know, as far as air coolers go, it's not entirely unreasonable. Um, does have instructions. Uh, there should be a custom back plate that's probably all in here. Yeah. So back plate. It looks like there's additional brackets for uh, if you wanted to install a second fan for push pull. Uh, looks like fan cables. And these. This is the back side of the bracket. This is the front side. We'll open all that in depth when we get to installation. Uh, but <clears throat> there's this chunky boy that'll be cool in my, my CPU. And I'm not, don't have any RGB or anything serious in my case. Uh, so I went with just the regular little black edition and black parts where I could. Keep your manual handy because I probably will need that when we get to that point. Next is our X570 Oris Elite. Uh, why? Why such a motherboard? Um, I normally buy. Okay, so my normal upgrade path. Every other year, I will upgrade CPU and then on the offset years, GPU. So for one year, I might upgrade my CPU, which may also require a motherboard upgrade, which may require a memory upgrade. So I'll spend $500 or so on CPU motherboard RAM. Uh, and then on the off years, I'll spend four or $500 on a GPU. Uh, and I've been on the Ryzen system for a while. I have current build, which is in complete disrepair, uh, is a 2700. Previous build was a 1700. Current next build is going to be a 5800. So I've been on the Ryzen platform for a little while. Theoretically, I could keep using the same board. Even now, uh, my previous B450 board, if I waited a little while, I could theoretically flash it and use this chip. Um, <clears throat> and I generally go with mid-range boards. So the B450, it's a decent board, nothing wrong with it, uh, but it's not the uh, X470, 490, whatever it was back in the day. Um, and I've always been kind of on that middle of the road level. Uh, what you get with a better board is better power delivery for overclocking. I don't overclock, so that doesn't appeal to me much. Uh, but what I did find on my B450 board was lack of certain features. Um, in particular, the way that they had the PCI lanes allocated to SATA was a little odd. So if I stuck in a second M.2 drive, then like two of my SATA ports just turned off, couldn't use them at all. Uh, so stuff like that shouldn't be a problem on a higher end board. Um, I don't really care, but you get like ARGB and stuff like that uh, um, on, on higher end boards. Uh, so when this guy came up on, I think he was also Prime Day. Uh, he was on a big sale. You know, I could spend either $120 on a X570 that was, you know, 
okay or you know a decent b550 or get this guy for like 150 couldn't pass that up so that's why i ended up with a pretty high-end board compared to the mid-range um, cpu and gpu that i have so anyway that's why that's the logic behind it at least uh, so if we open her up nice and smoky Don't be a jerk, tape. All right, there's the board itself. Uh, one thing that I don't know that I like about X570s is they all have active cooling. Uh, my understanding is that usually that fan doesn't spin at all. Uh, so we'll see what it actually does. And I'm sure it's even if it spins, it's probably going to be fairly slow and fairly quiet. So probably not an issue, but... Would rather have a passive board than an active board. Um, this RS does appear to have the I.O. shield like mounted to the board. Um, we'll have to see how that works out. I.O. shields have always been a pain in the butt. That's the least, second least fun part of building uh, in general is having to pop that I.O. shield into the right spot. Uh, so, good. Looks good. Good looking board. And in the box, what did they give us? A sticker that... Looks like it was shipped incorrectly. It's got little pokies in it. A couple of SATA cables. Let's go down there. This looks like a uh, front audio adapter. This looks like it's a tiny thumb screw for something. I'll have to that handy in the instructions. Uh, this is an M.2 screw. You can tell because it's tinier than every other screw in existence. Uh, hold on to these little buggers because if you lose one they're, they're hard to get back. Uh, I happen to have the ones you know from my old drives uh, handy so I, I probably won't necessarily need him. He'll go into one of those little bottles of screws uh, but most other case and fan screws you'll have by the gazillions. M.2 screws not so easy to come by. And then after that, it's just manuals and stuff. So we're going to leave the packaging out, I'll leave the manuals in the box, and place box on floor. <coughs> and then the next thing we're going to need uh, for this kind of first round of the build is the CPU. This is the Ryzen 7 5800X. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the 5800X and in particular its pricing. Uh, and I agree that at the $450 MSRP that it's at, uh, it probably should have either come with a cooler or they should have knocked $30 to $50 off. It, from a price to performance ratio, it doesn't do great uh, amongst the new uh, field of Ryzen processors. That said, I got, I'm going to rant a little. Well, rant maybe isn't the right word, but I'm going to uh, uh, criticize the community a little bit. Um, People are crapping on this processor because it isn't a price performance king. And I get, I get the value for dollar equation. That's, that's, I know it well, um, and, and most of my builds have primarily been built around getting the most for your dollar. Uh, and the 5600, from a gaming perspective, is a beast. And, and if you're going to be solely gaming, then a 5600, don't, don't spend more than the $300 for that shit. Um, and if you're going to be doing hardcore production work uh, and you're going to be making money off the CPU, then there's no reason not to get the 5900 or 5950 that are going to give you a lot more performance for $100 to $250, whatever, you know, a couple hundred dollars more. Uh, the problem that I have is people saying, well, it's just $75 more, or it's just $100 more, uh, and that's going to go with, for the video card as well. Sure. I could have upgraded from the 5800 to the 5900 and probably had to wait a little longer to get the price, uh, to get the, the part in. But that's a 10 to 15% price hike. Uh, I could have also gotten the Radeon 6800X instead of just the 6800 and spent another $75 there. Uh, I got a fancy motherboard, but you know, if I got my normal motherboard for $100, well, I could have spent the extra $40 and got the, the nice board like I ended up doing. Uh, and then, you know, that's another, you know, 25% there. I could have gotten nicer name brand RAM and spent another 20% there. And I could have gotten a, a larger, better heart, uh, SSD and spent another 20% there. It's great to say that 
why would you get this when this other thing's only $50 more? But if you don't need it, then that money's still going to waste whether it's a better value or not. And that's kind of the situation that I'm in with the 5800X. Um, I game, so I wanted a, a, a decent CPU for gaming, but I also do some video production. I also do some 3D rendering. I also, I, I'm a, a bumbling multitasker. I'll have gazillions of tabs open while I'm slicing in Cura, while I'm, you know, got my resolve open, open doing some video editing. Uh, so I need the threads, but I'm not making any money off the thing and whether my video encode takes an additional minute and a half doesn't really matter. So this is the CPU that met my needs for the lowest price. So sure, I could have gotten a 5900 and gotten a better CPU per dollar for another $100, but that $100 would be mostly wasted on me. I would not see the advantages of that extra $100. Uh, so you can, you can just another $50 more your entire build and spend 20, 25% more on you know, the whole darn thing and it's not going to perform any better than you needed it to for 25% less. Uh, and if you're like me, if I, you know, I upgrade often. Like I said, I upgrade, I try to upgrade annually. Uh, it, it turns out both the Ryzen uh, 2000 line, no, the Ryzen 3000 line, as well as the GeForce, the NVIDIA 2000 line just weren't, you know, they, they didn't offer enough for me to actually upgrade anything last year. So I'm, I'm on a two year old CPU and a three year old GPU. Um, but these things may get upgraded in the next year. So I'm not going to spend the extra on, you know, better price for performance when I'm going to upgrade it anyway. That's all I'm saying. So this is the fit why, why I got the 5800X. This was my target. I wasn't trying to get a 5900X and ended up with a 5800. This was the one that I picked and said, this is the right performance level for me. It's the cheapest I can spend to get that performance level. That's my CPU. So that's why 5800X is my choice. All right. Now I thought, let me see something here. Okay, good. They do come with some, some sticky. Um, <coughs> I'm going to open up the GPU a little later because uh, everything that's kind of the last thing to go in. Uh, so we'll get all of this stuff kind of rolling here. So let's start. I do try to use a surface whenever I install things on the motherboard because the back isn't flat. Um, you know, there's solder joints, there's brackets, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the back. Uh, so instead of setting it on something hard uh, as you're pushing down on memory and CPUs and stuff like that, um, this is a piece of cork board that I have for 3D printers. Uh, that'll give it a little bit of a, a little bit of cushioning uh, for some of those solders and, 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 and spiky bits. All right, so um, when you're putting together this board uh, and, and boards in general, um, okay, first of all, take everything I say with a grain of salt. If you have a different way of doing things, go your own way. Uh, what I do is uh, CPU, goes in first because it's flat. It doesn't do anything. Uh, I'll probably, I'll need to pull off these brackets. So I'll actually probably do that first. Uh, so CPU, memory, cooler, then in the case, uh, and then uh, all the attached cards after that. It's also strange that this one didn't have a little, usually they put like a little cover or something over it. But nothing there. If people can get real scared installing CPUs, a couple things you can do. If you look at the back of the CPU, there's a little uh, diamond and that aligns with a little diamond on the, uh... on. is this recording? Let me see something here. Nope. Okay, there, sorry about that. Um, there's a little diamond on the CPU and there's a little diamond on the, uh, the socket. And those two should align, and there should be no force required. As you can see, these pins are extremely fine. Uh, any pressure at all uh, will will bend those. And it's not necessarily going to kill the CPU if you bend them. You can theoretically bend them back maybe once or twice, um, but 
there's a good chance that, that you could do something very poor. Uh, so I'm going to line those. And then he just kind of sits in there, just falls right in. No pressure required. Now he's in there. Good. Drop the arm and he's locked in. All right. Easy part. Now I need to remove these brackets because the Hyper 212 has its own bracket. Definitely throw your screws all over your board. It's always a good idea. right out. <clears throat> all right, so you probably want to keep all these parts together. So if you do switch a cooler, a lot of cooler, well, not a lot, some coolers actually use the um, the bracket that came with the board. So they'll, they'll use this, this bracket uh, and attach to it. So you don't necessarily want to trash this guy, uh, but he's definitely not going to be useful for a while. So I'm going to screw them all back together and, and set them to the side. Uh, if I ever need them someday. And of course you can go out and buy new ones. It's not like hard to find or anything like that, but if you have a pile of other computer crap, might as well add this to it. Okay. All right, next. Uh, I'm going to use a precision screwdriver to remove this M.2 shield. Oops. And this also acts as a heat sink. Yep. So, uh, I've never actually had a heat sink for one of those. What I'm guessing I'm going to have to do is install the drive. Uh, and then install the heatsink on top of it and then let it stick to it uh, because I don't know that I can get it properly aligned just randomly sticking it. So we're going to leave that over there. Our one terabyte drive is going to be our main drive. Uh, and generally, <clears throat> the, the top drive, the one closest to the CPU, uh, is the main uh, M.2 slot. The main slot, the, the, the primary M.2 slot, has dedicated PCI lanes. Uh, so it's going to be theoretically faster and share less bandwidth with all the other crap on the board um, than the other slot. So you definitely want to stick your, your, your main drive in the main slot. Yeah, that's going to be too long, so I need to... Oh, this little fella. How he... Is he in there? Is he screwed in? I'd hate to unscrew something that doesn't screw you. All right, what I'm guessing here, so normally, like on this bottom one, it looks like this guy actually unscrews and moves. So let's, let's do that real quick. So on this bottom one, I can move this little standoff. So that when I put in the drive, and M.2s, they slide in at about like a 30 degree angle. And then you can kind of push them down the hole a line, then you just put that screw in there and it holds them them together. Actually, hold on here. Use this one. All right. So the secondary one is self-explanatory. Uh, this primary one um, can't move this standoff because 
the heat shield is a specific size. So what I think I'm going to have to do is kind of shove this guy in and get him ready. Boy, that seems weird not having a standoff there. Let me see if they have one in the box. Ah, that may be what the, yeah, that's what that other thumb screw guy was. That's the other standoff. All right. So we're going to put that standoff in like so. SSD, 30 degree angle, line him up, push him down. All right, he is secure. Now, heat shield, I'm going to remove the plastic, put him back into the little slot that he came from. Line him up. If he touches, it's just barely. I think it's just for show, guys. All right, secured. All right. Okay, so M.2 SSDs are installed, CPUs installed. I think I want to do that bracket next because it's going to have to go around the back of the board. All kinds of fun stuff in this bag. Okay, well, let's see what they say to do here. Now, all of these cooler, well, all coolers in general have slightly different instructions. Um, <clears throat> the simplest ones are the ones that just attach to the OEM bracket. Uh, usually, there's just a clip or a screw for those. But everything with its own bracket, you might want to double check the instructions to make sure you do it right. And as you can see, they lay them out for different systems. So here's Intel, 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 AMD. Here we go. All right. Made E and M. Where's the punch list? What's E and M? Okay. Looks like E's are these guys here. And M's are these plastic Brackety things. One, two, three, four. All right. So we got our E's, got our M's. And those go on here right now. So mine doesn't say Intel. AMD. Okay, there we go. All right. You can see the AMD here. The E's are going to go into here, and they should fit in that little channel. And then the M's clip on. suspect so these have like two positions I suspect they're all going to need to be in a specific oh here AM4 it says right here so AM4 
going to be that one, just not the right one. Okay, so give me one second. Come on. <laughs> oh, here, I can adjust it here. So eight and four are going to be over here. Okay, that looks right. So this is A and B. Yeah, okay. I think that one that one's actually probably backwards. Because looking at it from the wrong angle here. So AM4. We can't even see that right. So AM4 is the slot closest to the uh, the long part of the bracket. So I think I messed up the other one. We'll go fix that here. So let's get this one popped on. Closer to the bracket. All right, so this one is farthest from the bracket. I'm going to pop that off and redo him. So come on off. Oh, that's enough there. Got it. Perfect. Closest to the bracket. Closest to the bracket. Closest to the bracket. Closest to the bracket. All right. That should be correct for AM4. Then we just install it on the back side. So hopefully this all aligns well. Look at that. Pokies through the holies, doing good. And then we use these big old Fs. Same on both sides. Are in, and then they give you this little tool, um, basically just a little socket that has a Phillips backing. Tighten that up. Now with everything computers, you don't want to go crazy over tightening stuff. Um, you could damage the board, you could damage the screw threading. So, you know, make it tight, but don't, don't, don't go crazy. Okay, so that little guy's in. Uh, next step they're saying is the uh, the uh, uh, thermal compound, but we're gonna do that in a minute. Uh, next, I wanna pop in the RAM. And the reason I do it in that order is that if, you know, this, the CPU cooler is pretty big. He's gonna sit atop something like that. Uh, and that's going to make it tricky to get to these RAM slots. So might as well get it, uh, get that RAM installed before you have to mess with all that stuff. Uh, and RAM, uh, depending on the board, some boards have like a fixed, one fixed side and then one side that pops out. Uh, this board has both sides that, that pop out. So all you gotta do is align the RAM with the, the notch, push it in, 
and then it'll it'll click into place. Uh, if you got a board that's got one side that's that's fixed and the other side pops, then you kind of want to you know, keep it pretty level, but but kind of ease the, the the fixed side in, uh, and then you know that side will be lower, and then pop in the other side until it, it clips up. It's more tricky with the one fixed side because you're, you're never quite sure if that fixed side is kind of in perfectly. Um, so be a little more careful if you do have one fixed side. This side, you know, this board has two pop ins, so I just push it straight down, no problem. Um, <clears throat> I have four sticks that are identical, so I'm filling four slots with those four sticks. I don't have to worry about the the, the uh, DDR channels or anything like that. Uh, most boards, this kind of the, the the from the left, the second and the fourth are like the primary channel, and then the the first and the third are like the secondary. So you'd want to populate two and four first, uh, and then one and three. Uh, and if you do populate, like most people would not knowing any better would populate one and two just because they're next to each other and, and that's only going to give you single data rate because um, those are on, on separate channels. So if you don't know, look in your manual. Uh, if you can't find your manual or, or bought third party or something like that um, or uh, second hand and you don't have a manual, go with two and four. That's usually the safe bet. If you got all four, pop them in. Uh, if you're using unmatched pairs, like if you're using like a couple of eights and a couple of sixteens or something crazy like that, uh, then you're going to have to worry about it again. Obviously, you can't just throw them in willy nilly. So you, you'll, the matched pairs will have obviously have to be on the same channel, uh, and you'll probably want your larger pair on the <coughs> the uh, the first channel. So slots two and four would be your larger set of memory, and then one and three would be your smaller one. But not a problem for us. Okay. So RAM is installed. Everything that you know that's that's pretty easy to get in. Uh, so everything on the front of the board is good. I think we we are ready to pop on the cooler. Um, so instructions are put on thermal paste, remove sticky. I don't know why they're waiting till here to have you attach the brackets to the fan. We're gonna do that first. <coughs> Let's get this guy out of the way for a little bit. So these brackets go on like so. Looks like they go on this side though. Okay, so that makes sense. All right, um, there's only two screws that fit. <coughs> Same goes here, tight, not too tight. Actually, I can't tell. Is that the straight or the, it's, I'll have to look it up. That may be the straight bracket. It's kind of hard to tell from this picture. Yeah, that's supposed to be the straight bracket. All right, well, pull that guy back off. Straight bracket. That's okay, you got to attack that one at an angle, don't you? All right. Bracketed. I want you to 
remove the fan and I see why I was kind of criticizing them, but these screws, the only way you can get to those screws is by this kind of notch out of the cooling, uh, out of the heat sink. So fan not going to work there and got to remember the orientation. So no cap for that fan. So you see one side's got a, you know, the, the bracket that holds the motor in place. So the open side is the one that faces out. All right. So now thermal paste. This is one that really ignites some passions on the interwebs. Uh, and it's really not that big a deal, except for when you lose it. Um, Gamers Nexus did some, some testing because there's been a lot of talk about, you know, too much thermal paste, too little thermal paste, whether you need to spread it out or just leave it, you know, in a, in a little ball in the middle. Uh, what's the right way and how much is the right amount? And, oh, here it is. And their findings were pretty much do what you want. Um, there wasn't a lot of, a lot of difference between somebody who, you know, just used the little pea in the middle versus somebody who spread it all very thinly versus somebody who used way too much. I mean, they globbed it on and it was fine. Um, so people make a big deal out of putting on thermal paste when it's kind of really not. Uh, so I, I go with pea size in the middle. Uh, and I leave it at that. And when I say P size, that's P volume. So a P is a sphere. It's not a, you know, it's not flat. It's not a half circle, uh, or it's not a half. <clears throat> uh, it's not a cylinder. It's 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 a ball. Uh, so if you imagine, if you took a P and smashed it down, it's about how much you'd have. Then <clears throat> brackets on. Yeah, just do what looks right. We're going to put this guy on. Now try to get this right the first time-ish, because uh, you are smashing around. And as I say that, it looks like that doesn't look like the right bracket to me. What happens if I can I move these two out? You can see that's smashing out that 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 secret sauce. Um, so if you screw it up too much, then you're going to get juice everywhere, and it's not going to cool as well. You definitely want to avoid touching it. So what I'm doing is I'm moving these little guys out. <clears throat> See if that gives us the right alignment. We're still not there. AM4. AM4, straight bracket. At least it looks like we have it. See, it's the straight bracket. They're just not aligning. I wonder if these things are offset slightly differently. Let me flip them around. So it does look like they do have a little bit of an angle to them, which I did not notice initially.
So now let's see if you're any closer to the line. That looks much better. Yeah, okay, so these brackets, if you can kind of see these brackets bend a little bit. Um, so then these screws are forced out by that bend. And, and if you don't have them, if you have them backwards, bends in, not out. And now those look like they're aligning. Screw these in, do it like a car tire, do the corners, then the opposite corners. It's really the spring pressure that's holding this thing onto the CPU. Um, so when you tighten these screws down, you'll, you'll kind of feel them stop. Don't need to go crazy because again, it's the springs that are really doing the work, not so much the, the screw force. Okay. So then we can put our fan back on. Um, thing you got to worry about here, first of all, I need to make sure I get it on the right way. So, so the, the non-bracketed side goes out. Uh, and then there's a fan header on the board. Let's see, it's this fan, CPU fan. All right, so if here, see this one, CPU fan. That's going to be where this guy attaches to, so I want the cabling to be as close as possible to that. And then we're going to... So I'm going to feed them out that direction. I'm not going to say I'm a huge fan of these brackets. Right. Make sure he's in the right spot there. Okay, fan is installed and get that guy off there. Hopped up to the board. All right. So now I'm going to take all that other. Fan crap and throw it back in the box. <clears throat> so, memory, CPU, M.2s, all installed, ready to go. Uh, I think we're ready to put this fella into the case. Alright, 
now. Let's stop you. Get you out of the way. All right. So Leon Lee Land Cool Two Mesh. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, as with all cases that have tempered glass side panels, uh, most of them you have to remove them completely. Um, but that's not necessarily the case with the Land Cool Mesh because it opens like a door. Uh, so, you know, if you do need access to your PC, you can flip open this door. No thumb screws, no tools required. You're not going to lose the panel. It just flips open and closed. That's great, but uh, can make it a pain to, to build in. So these things lift right off and we're going to put them out the way. All right, so with that out the way, we can lay him down. Get that off there for now too. And we're ready to install the board. I left the old IO shield in this guy, so we'll take him and throw him elsewhere. Bring you back. Okay. So inside the case, uh, most cases have pre-installed standoffs for the motherboard. That's where the screws are going to go to. That's where you align everything. So it makes it pretty easy to figure out where stuff goes. Uh, some of them <clears throat> will give you the standoffs in a bag and just a set of uh, you know just holes in the. In the metal. Uh, those are a little less straightforward because uh, you do have to kind of figure out which ones you need to populate. Um, but for our purposes, it looks like everything was, you know, ready to go. So we're going to place the board. And the CPU cooler is attached to the board better than pretty much anything else. So don't be afraid to kind of grab it by the cooler. Now, don't we, you know, don't torque it too much, um, but for lowering it in and getting it aligned, it's not a bad handle. And I can see one problem. I don't like that the, the this this shield is just to hide cable management. Uh, some cases have like grommets. Uh, the NZXT has like a giant bar that goes all the way down. This guy has just this this little kind of tiny bar to hide it. Uh, but it does look like it's going to interfere with at least two of the SATA ports, which is going to be a bummer. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. But it is what it is. So now, looks like I'm just a little off on some of the holes. I'm going to see if I can finagle it around just a touch more. It might be as close as it's going to get. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to install the case screws. Um, or install the, uh, the motherboard standoff screws. I would suggest putting a screw in every hole that has a standoff behind it. Uh, you may be inclined to use less screws than is necessary, just because it's a pain getting all these screws in the right spots. But uh, if you see a hole and you see a standoff, you'd be doing yourself a favor by putting a screw in it. Because uh, if you do need to, you know, when you plug stuff in or unplug it, it's going to be yanking on that board and you want it secured as good as possible. Generally, at least in, in my experience, the screws have come with the case. So if you're opening everything brand new and you're looking in your motherboard box being like, oh, where are all my screws? A motherboard will include screws for M.2 and they may include, you know, if you have kind of some kind of specific goofy bracket for you know, vertical mounting or something like that. They may have special screws for that. Um, but usually it's the case that gives you the motherboard screws. Now 
This part is not exciting. It doesn't hurt if your screwdriver has just a touch of magnetism to it. You obviously don't want to go crazy. You don't want to touch it to anything, but just having that little bit of a magnetic force holding the screw on is quite handy. And with my Leon Lee, <clears throat> I, uh, I picked the Land Cool 2 mesh because of, ex of, of ex accessibility. I like the door design, uh, all the toolless features and stuff like that. And um, it was exceptionally, uh, it performed exceptionally from a cooling perspective. Uh, there's a lot of airflow in this case. And in fact, uh, Gamers Nexus just published their best cases of 2020 with Land Cool 2 mesh taking the prize for best airflow. So it's a great case uh, for a number of reasons, not only just the, the airflow. Now from here, you're, you're probably going to be inclined. You have all these front bracket items. Mine are already fed through the side, but if you if you have a different case, they might just kind of be dangling that are shoved into the, a pocket in the case or something like that. You might be inclined to just take those and plug them straight into all the, the jibber-jabber on the board. Don't I'll take a little... It's not... People make a big deal out of cable management. It's not that hard, man. Just just take a minute and get stuff kind of kind of straight and, and kind of in the right spot. Uh, it's going to pay dividends later, not only in cooling performance but also in like you know how do I get my crap uh, situated type of performance. Um, so um, take so take a little time and and put on some you know some effort towards cable management. Uh, don't you know we're, I'm not resleeving cables. I'm not buying paracorded cables or anything like that. Just putting stuff in the right spot. Uh, as you can see, these are already fed through. Uh, and this is the worst part of building a PC, in my opinion, is all the front panel BS, lining it up with where it's supposed to go on the motherboard. Because um, they give you usually a big bank of pins and then some kind of labeling, which I'm struggling to find here. I'm gonna have to twist this guy, so my apologies. Yeah, so it's, it's probably difficult to see even on the camera, but underneath this box, there's uh, labels for all of the front panel connectors. And it's a pain to read it, it's a pain to align them, but what you gotta do. Uh, so all I have is power switch, power LED resets, so I don't have to worry about anything else. So power LED is first, plus on the left. Power switch is next. And then reset switch is below. Man, hands too big. I need jerk. All right, I'm gonna do reset first and then we'll come back to the others. Reset first. Done. Power switch next. LED next. View on the inside and you on the outside. 
Success, all right. Pain in the butt. Front USB 3 is one giant plug. They label giant USB 3, can't, can't miss that. Sorry for the bump. Done. Um, I have a front USB-C that I don't see up here. I think I had left that on the back side because I couldn't use it on my old board. So let's see if I can get that pulled through real quick. Front USB C. Okay, but it looks like it goes either way. So we can plug you in right there. That's the other thing about cheap boards, like uh, my B450 did not have a front USB C connector. It only had one USB 3 connector. Um, yeah. Okay. I need to check the direction of that fan. Like, I know that it blows out, uh, but I forgot. If it's, my guess is that it should be forcing. So I think I should be flipping that on the other side. Um, so let's do that real quick. Wrong side. There, I think that's probably more appropriate, but we'll see when we power it on. Okay. So, motherboard, CPU, fans are all in. Front I.O. is attached. M.2s are installed. I think now we can probably add in that second SSD and then do the PSU. All right. So generally the way the power supplies are installed is that the big intake fan goes to the bottom, sucks in air from the bottom of the case, and exhausts out the back. Um, that's the only way you can mount it in the Landcool 2 uh, mesh uh, due to the hole pattern on the back. Kind of flip that around a little bit so you can see. That, uh, there's kind of this one offset hole in power supplies. Uh, so if you don't mount it specifically with caring for that offset hole, then, then not all the screws line up. Uh, so we're gonna do just that. And this PSU is semi-modular. The uh, ATX 24 pin or whatever that is, uh, is the only thing that isn't that doesn't come off. And that's actually not going to fit. I'm going to go into the other side. Sorry, I have to rotate this again. Uh, all the other cables are modular. Um, actually, I take that back. ATX power. Yeah, and that's the 8-pin. Um, 
So board power is not modular, everything else can come off. These slide right in there like so. I think I have PSU screws around here somewhere. Two, can I roll them off the table? Oh, I think I got more. So, nothing tricky about screwing this guy in. And now, oh, there's a, they're stuck to a magnet on the case. Um, I think I'm going to feed through my SATA cables first, uh, and then we'll start pulling power to the board. All right, so I'll just come with, came with four. So I'll use the new SATA cables. Um, um, so I'm going to need four. I have three in the hot swap bay. In this case, by default, comes with this bank blank back plate uh, for this for the hard drive cage, uh, and all it is, is is cutouts. So when you slide a hard drive into the chassis, the SATA and power are exposed. Uh, the back plate has basically a, a SATA and a power repeater uh, on the back plate itself. And the, when the drive slides in, it shoves into that, that repeater. Uh, so that's kind of the difference here. And the, the downside is that all, you know, if you want to use them, all three of the hot swap connectors need to be connected. Um, whereas if you just had one hard drive, you'd need one SATA cable, one power cable, done. Uh, whereas I'm going to have to connect all three of them. So if I take those three, the three hot swap bays, and then the one two and a half inch SATA drive, that's four uh, SATA drives, which that's every SATA port that looks like it's, it's accessible on this board given the location of that, uh, that cable shroud. These guys have to go. Most SATA cables, not all, but most have one 90 degree bend and then one straight side. Um, it seems logical that like this bend, the bend would go at the motherboard uh, because it's it's making a 90 degree turn to go out the you know behind the shroud. But these uh, hot swap connectors are all pressed up against the side of the cage, so you really need to save the 90 degree bend for the back of the hot swap cage. Shroud really makes this a pain in the butt. What are you doing here? There we go. Got it. All right. One down. All 
It actually looks like they gave two with straight ends and two with one straight 190 degree bend. So I'll probably grab some other ones, some other SATA cables that have the 90 degree bend. Get some white on you, but that's okay. Actually, you know what? I can actually use one of the straight straights because I'll use that for the the SATA drive, the hanging drive. Straight one will be used right here. Okay. All four saddles are pulled through. So now we're ready to start working on the back side. All right, so first thing you probably want to do is get the big boy out of the way. Um, I can see that right here is where the connector go, uh, uh, where the motherboard connector is at. So I'm just going to feed him in as close as possible there, and we'll see about using some zip ties to keep him in place. And the thing with all these power connectors is they take a little bit of force to get in there, and that can seem wrong. Um, but it's not. Um, so push him in until he's fully seated and he clicks. There we go. Uh, he makes a very abrupt 90 degree bend in this case. So I might even squeeze him in. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we do we'll, when we clean up the cables later. And he's going to run up this channel right here. Uh, I will zip tie him later because the zip ties are single use. You can also use Velcro if you have the right length. Um, the zip ties take up less room and they're easier to work with overall, but the Velcro is reusable, so it's kind of you know six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, I'll be using little zip ties for this one. And then these guys got all messy, so we're going to feed you three down here. Wrapped up and everything. Hold on. All right, come on, come on now. Where are y'all? All right, there we go. All three of you through. Straight one is the one that's got to go over here. The rest of you will go down here. There's no cable tied directly. I guess this is going to be the closest one. So I'm going to try to feed all three of these as close as possible to that one tie down spot. I have a feeling this is just going to end up being a kind of a sloppy mess. There's just too much cable down here for him. And there's three of them. So let's kind of run him over here. And you're going to connect here like so.
Okay, so SATA cables are good on, for the hot swap bay. I'm gonna follow a similar pattern, only you stop here. This one I'm gonna hook up last because I have a lot of other cabling to do behind him. All right, so now power, what do we got here? These are the two by uh, four by twos, so these are going to be for video. So they're probably gonna come through here, let's see. They're probably gonna come through this basement hole. Next, this is the four x two for the motherboard power, which is a connector way up here. So we're gonna run you right through here. And just leave you there for now. And then here's our SATAs. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, I'm going to need one for the hard drive. Uh, two for the drive cage, yeah, and here's this third one for fan controller? I think it's fan controller. But regardless, three of them here, one of them on that hard drive. So these are the close guys, we'll do them first. That is a big old mess. In fact, let's undo these two. Let's get you under these. That is a lot of connectors all in one spot. Um, let's see what we can do. We can definitely get Two of you shoved back there. You're gonna have to kind of sit down here at the bottom, and I still need to get you ran up there. So that's as good as she's gonna get without some extensions or something like that. That is hooked up. That's a big old mess of cables right there. Still closes, so I guess we're good enough. So let's grab some cable ties. Don't think I'm gonna need too many just because there's just not a lot of room for this stuff to go. Um, You guys all out of the way. I think I can get all three of two, three, you. some snips so I can cut those off. All right. And then I want to put a couple around you.
I don't know that I need to, well, let's do it. It's only one cable. Let's get that guy cut off anyway. So I don't know that I need to worry about cutting these guys off because they're going to be held uh, behind that big shield thing that fits there, but we'll leave it there anyway. Uh, these guys are just kind of all over the place. Yeah, I probably won't do much with that just because, again, they're going to be behind that shield and they're they're fine. Um, all right, so let's get that last eight pin hooked up here. Make sure he's going in the right spot. Where did he go? He's hitting up beside the fan. This guy's always tough to get to as well because he's so far up there. Uh, it's not as bad when you don't have that extra fan up the top, but it's not much room for man, my man hands. Okay. All right. So there's what the front looks like. Again, pull everything as close to where it comes, or you know, as where it's needed as possible. Um, I think we did that, so I think that's pretty good. Um, we got the video card next. I believe so. right back down in fact let's get you out of the way so I can unbox this video card and pull you right back in drop the thumb screw damn it okay 6800 non XT yes I know the XT is a better value for the dollar but I don't care. I wanted to spend between four and five hundred dollars on a GPU, uh, which would have put me in thirty seventy territory just barely. But eight gig of RAM on the thirty seventy, I thought was going to be a limitation, especially as I get more into video editing and three D and three D uh, graphics and design and Blender stuff like that. So sixteen gig of memory. Um, you know, RTX performance obviously isn't as great as as the uh, as the NVIDIA cards, but raw rasterization, Radeon has it. Uh, little concern over the drivers, uh, over the you know whether there's any bugs in the quality of, of you know rendering and encoding and stuff like that. But given that these Radeon cards are going to be very popular in the PC space, they're in every console. You know, there's going to be millions of them. I have a feeling that. AMD is going to have the resources to spend to make these things great. So I went with the 6800 instead of the 3070. 3080, 6800 XT were not options. So this is where I am. Um, and I'll add that, you know, I, I have 90 subscribers and a couple dozen videos. So I did not get any special treatment to get this, these cards or that CPU. Uh, I waited in line like everybody else. And I have a whole video on how to shop for this stuff using free tools and, and apps and stuff like that. Um, I found this Radeon. This is from AMD. This was using a distill based web page watcher. The 5800 was using stock alerts from hot stock. Uh, so no, no tricks, no, you know, I didn't, you know, pay for a bot or join like a, a resell group or anything crazy. I just turned on some basic, you know, tools and let it go until the right things happened. So. And it took like, Maybe a week for the 5800. That's back when they were rare. Now you can you can get them all the time. Um, and then it took maybe two days for the 6800. I think that was just good timing. And as you are likely aware, 
the 6800 or 6000 series AIB launch was launch was a few days ago. Almost no cards. They're all ridiculously priced. So the first party card is kind of the one to get if you're at all budget constrained. Uh, and I'll say this thing is a big chonker, man. This is this is a heavy box. Uh, and I, what I'm coming from. Is this 1070 arrow? This is this is a 1070. It's a li little little baby card, little little baby card, little baby fan. You know, just super tiny to seven pounds of of aluminum and and death. Right. So packaged nicely, looks good. Never owned a first party AMD card. I've owned I think an R390 was my only other AMD card. Little instruction booklet. That, that's useless. Thanks for that. Uh, and there's the beautiful card itself. Great, great looking card, man. All the, all the first party cards have been fantastic. The NVIDIA's looked fantastic. They had that weird cooler design. This card looks spectacular. And I am, seriously, man, this is, this is some metal. Like this thing is large. Man, that's that's a chonker. Um, like this is like maybe I want to get a bracket for it, kind of big. Like that that's a heavy card. Um, yeah, that's gonna be fun. And what else we got in here? That's it. There's no. You know, I guess who needs a driver CD anymore? Um, I would have thought AMD would have been like, here's a sticker or something along those lines. Um, so it seems bare bones, man. It seems like you get the card, you get this, this little instruction manual. Uh, don't get me wrong, the packaging is nice, uh, but just not a lot to it. So fantastic. Uh, you know, I guess I appreciate that they wouldn't weigh it down with garbage, but uh, all right. Quick unboxing, but man, this is it's a good looking card. And it's just so heavy. Uh, so the, the setup that I run, I have uh, one ultra wide and then two, it's a, tw I guess a 24, 16 by nine and a 24, 16 by 10 monitor. Uh, and I think I'm running HDMI to two of them and DisplayPort to one or, or, or maybe vice versa. Uh, so not a ton of connectivity on this card. Um, two display ports, one HDMI, and then a USB-C. Uh, I do have an Oculus Rift S, which uses a display port now, but I'm getting a Quest 2, I hope. Um, so I think I'll be able to use that USB-C for that Quest 2 and not have to worry about kind of the missing display port. And I have no problem switching one of my monitors to display port from HDMI. That's, that's not a big deal. So I'm okay with the connectivity. Uh, it's not exactly like abundant or exorbitant or anything like that, but it's, it, it's fine. It works. Uh, and then, you know, people talk about the red ring and the, you know, the, the overall redness of the card. Uh, again, I'm not that big into aesthetics, so I'm fine with it. I'm sure it'll look great. Um, yeah, is what it is. Uh, fans look fantastic. Like uh, just the whole brushed aluminum and like magnesium black is just fantastic looking. Like I don't like again. I'm not big on aesthetics, but damn, that looks good. All right, let's let's get them in. Stop talking. Opa. So it shouldn't be too much of a trick, uh, just a regular old PCI Express video card. It's a two slot. I've already removed, my previous card was also two slot, so the, the little back panel thingies here have already been removed. Uh, so it should just be a matter of sliding them in. This USB-C cable might have to adjust the mate a little bit. I 
All right. Chonker is in there. While I'm here, I'm going to pop in the video capture card as well. And then, so I think ideally, uh, I would use two separate um, two by four PCIe cables, uh, but I don't have my, like the, the other uh, modular cable. I, I don't know where I put it. So for now, I'm gonna plug it in using one uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back and address that after. After what, Danielson? After, after. I'm done with this guy. Get him out of the way. And then we're going to pull through as much of that video card cable as possible so that he's got the straightest path. And that's what the inside of the case looks like with the RTX or the uh, RX 6800 hotness installed. So with that, I think I'm ready to pop the sides on and see if she posts. All right, camera kicked off, so let's try this one more time. Everything's connected, power is ready to go, PSU is on, um, Franken monitor is powered up. but nothing on the post. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna do some research and see, because I, I believe I can flash this BIOS just via thumb drive, uh, at least I hope. Uh, so I'm gonna have to take a look at that and uh, I'll probably pause the video and get back to you in a minute. So after hours of screwing around with different hardware, different BIOSes, replacing the CPU, replacing the GPU, pulling out the RAM, putting in different RAM, trying different video cards, I discovered that apparently the Oros Elite X570 doesn't like HDMI. If I had HDMI plugged in, one in a thousand times it would come up on the monitor, maybe two or three times I saw it in total. If I have a DisplayPort plugged in, Every single time it came up. So if you're having the same problem, don't use HDMI, use DisplayPort. I bet the thing works. And again, that's across video cards. Both my 1070 and the Radeon 6800 both have the same problem. Across CPUs, both the 5800X uh, as well as my old 2700, same problem. Um, after QFlash, 
it would come up with the BIOS reset message, or if I manually reset the BIOS, it would come up with the BIOS reset message over HDMI, but anything past that generally didn't work. So that's that. So now I'm just replacing and reinstalling everything and getting it back to where it should be. All right. M.2s are reinstalled. SATA is reconnected. Power is all attached. USB 3 is hooked up. USB C is hooked up. Memory. Got to get the memory back in. Three and number four. Okay. All right, everything's back in. I'm going to turn it on just before before I close it, close the thing up. I'm going to make sure it works one more time. It's a good sound. All right, great. All right. All right, so I have a working combination of BIOS and hardware. Fortunately, I ended up getting um, thermal paste all over everything, but that's all right. Okay, shields are back on. All right. Get your thumb screw in. Oh, I guess the, putting the thumb screws in to the video card would be a good idea. So now Franken monitor doesn't support. Um, Display port. So, might be screwed, might not be able to show you anything. Um, let me see if I can get a converter and maybe we can do like a display port to DVI thing and get it working. Success. All right, now I think you're probably getting a lot of glare on that. Let's see if I can fix some of that. Okay, yeah, it's already got a Windows installation, um, but that is not the one we want. Um, I want to get into BIOS and make sure my memory settings and my hard drive settings are all correct and that kind of stuff, and then we'll do a Windows install.
You guys, yeah, the corner's cut off a little bit, but. Because you can never enter BIOS unless you hit delete like a madman. All right, here we go. Got two M.2s and one SATA, so it detects all my hard drives. That's great. Boot sequence is Rocket Q first. That is what I want. At least go into advanced mode here. So CPU ratio mode, XMP is, how do I change it? Hmm. All right. Well, the boot stuff is what I really wanted to check. I'll come in here and tweak this all later. The main things that I want to do is make sure my memory is running at 3200. Um, make sure my boot stuff is right. Turn off, what is it, uh, the CS, CMS, CSM, the compatibility mode stuff that just slows down and, and messes stuff up. Um, and then, you know, make sure temps and stuff are set okay. So I, for now, I think I'm good. Uh, I am going to pop in my installation media. So we are going to do a fresh install of Windows. Looks like F12 is boot menu. I'm used to it being F8 for some reason. Yeah. Should have created it from Windows Media Creator and not from Rufus. Let's see if it'll let me boot UEFI using the stick. UEFI. Kingston Data Trap, but that looks right. English, English, United States. And I'm going to use one later. And I'm going to go with Pro. Do a custom install. Drive competition one. This is the Western Digital, so I want the other one terabyte drive. So drive zero is uh, Bywin, drive one is Western Digital, so drive two must be my. Um, Rocket Q. So I'm removing all the existing partitions. Oh, 
drive to. And we'll install there. All right, so Windows is going to install. I'm going to let it do its thing uh, and finish the Windows setup. Then we'll come back. We'll put all the shell on. I'm going to put it back where it belongs, and then I'll, uh, I'll run some benchmarks to let you know how the upgrades did. All right, so Windows installed, no problem. I uh, think she's probably ready to go back to where she lives, uh, and I can you know, set it up, complete setup on my regular monitors. Uh, but everything appears to be at least running for the moment. Um, so I'm going to put the sides on. We're going to take some pictures of her as she is and I'll show you how clean she is. And then uh, that'll be it. <clears throat> if anyone's interested in making their own Franken monitor out of a uh, broken panel, Feel free to shout. The panel itself has to be okay, but if you uh, you know cracked a case or uh, you have a laptop that uh, no longer functions, then removing that monitor and spending twenty five dollars for a controller board is kind of a good deal. All right. <clears throat> so with no glass on from the front. Obviously, you know, looks very clean. Uh, everything exits as quickly as it as it can. You know, uh, all the cable management is done on the back. Not a big mess of of spaghetti up front. Uh, so, you know, kudos to the Leon Lee for for being so easy to build in. The only thing I'm a little bit concerned about is the uh, the RX 6800 is resting right up against this this channel stopper thing, channel Haiti bar thing. Um, it doesn't seem to be pushing on the card. Like it seems to be just kind of touching. Um, like it's not like it's not like the card's not fully seated or anything like that. So I think it's probably okay. Uh, but um, you know, heads up on you know, especially if you got something a bit larger and a bit more bulky than that, because uh, it, it is touching that that channel for sure. Uh, but everything else, you know, it was it was a pleasure building in this case the first time. It's a pleasure building in it this time. No issues with with the case other than that bar might not be in the right exact right spot for all video cards. Um, the Oris X570 Elite, man, that that HDMI versus DisplayPort thing, that was a big pain in the butt. That took a long time to figure out. I did a lot of stuff, you know, pulled apart the other motherboard and CPU combinations. Um, flashed the BIOS a handful of times, pulled cabling all over the room, um, all to find out that it doesn't like HDMI. That, and and I, that seems like a, a bonkers thing for, for a BIOS. So you, for a BIOS to prefer one display connectivity over another. Um, don't get it, but okay, seems to be working. If you're having the same problem, though, if with a RS, probably any of the Oris line, um, try switching to, DV, or, uh, to a display port. See if it helps out. Now run back. The uh, the shields do a lot of the work here. Uh, it's kind of a mess behind these shields. I mean, everything's tied up and it's all channeled uh, by the way it should be, but uh, that's not pretty. Uh, these shields really hide a lot of that uh, a lot of that mess. Uh, and this is tempered glass on both sides. It's not like this is a solid steel panel, so it's great to have that that, you know, camouflage for your stuff. Um, on the front, uh, I'll point out that somebody in the YouTube comments on my first review of this case pointed out that, hey, this whole thing's mesh. Why don't you make the stopper plug mesh? Uh, in case you didn't watch my review or Gamers Nexus review, uh, one of the things that Gamers Nexus pointed out is that when this case attaches to the front, there's this big gap down at the bottom. So when it, when it, you know, lays flush against the front. There's all this space here that can suck up dust, dirt, crap from the the ground. Uh, so I designed and printed a 3D printer. That is a plug that fits into that slot. Usually pretty easily. There, um, that fits into that slot and then rests flush against the front of the case. So there's there's no air at all. 
uh, going through there. And somebody pointed out, hey, if, it's, if everything's mesh, why don't you make that mesh? So there's a mesh version as well. I don't recommend the mesh version necessarily. Uh, I don't think you're going to gain much by drawing in air from down there and printing perforations is difficult and time consuming. So it's probably not worth the effort, but it's there if you need it. All right, so now I'm going to move this computer back over to where it belongs and uh, we'll install some games and see how she runs. So before we get into the benchmarks, let's take a look at the two systems. Uh, my original system was a Ryzen 2700 X on an ASRock B450 Pro motherboard with a GeForce GTX 1070 non-TI. Both systems use the same 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. That's It's 3200 memory, but the XMP profile on the 2700 clocks it to 2933. Both systems use the same one terabyte M.2 PCIe SSD. Both systems use the same Corsair 750 watt PCSU. Uh, the new system is Ryzen 5800X on a gigabyte Aorus Elite X570, and it's using the Radeon RX 6800. This time, the XMP profile for the 16 gigabytes of RAM clocked it to 3200. Uh, and again, it's using the same SSD and PSU. All benchmarks are run on an LG ultra wide monitor at 3440 by 1440. It's only a 60 hertz monitor, but VSync was off for all tests. So looking at some generic non-gaming benchmarks, uh, Cinebench was just under twice as fast, so an 84% uh, performance improvement. TimeSpy Extreme was almost two and a half times as fast with 142% improvement. For the DaVinci Resolve render, I took a 22 minute video, it's actually a previous video from this channel, and rendered it again on both systems. Uh, from the same storage device, using the same output profiles, everything was identical except for one was in the old system, one was in the new. And I only saw a 17% improvement. Now I am using the free version of DaVinci Resolve and not the studio version, uh, so I don't know that there's any graphic uplift. Uh, I think it's purely CPU rendering. And maybe having those two extra cores in that 2700 really you know, balanced out the performance between the, the older 2700 and the newer 5800X. I was still expecting more than a 17% improvement though. So looking at the gaming benchmarks, GTA 5 showed an extremely healthy 324% improvement over the old system. That's almost four and a quarter times as fast as the old system. Uh, fantastic result on GTA 5. Borderlands eked out just over twice the frame rate, uh, and Watch Dogs did just a little bit better than that. In the second set of gaming benchmarks, Ashes of the Singularity only improved slightly, only a 34% improvement there. I know that the game is very CPU intensive and thread heavy, uh, so maybe having a couple extra cores on the 2700 helped it out there, uh, but I'm still surprised to only see a 34% lift on Ashes of the Singularity. And then Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Ghost Recon both doubled almost two and a half times the performance on Ghost Recon Breakpoint. So there you have it. That, that's about two hours of watching me upgrade a computer. I hope you enjoyed it if you managed to stick around for the whole thing. Uh, if you did like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you liked my other videos, please subscribe and I will see you in the next one.